Motoring 2009 on TSN is brought to you by the new Q Horsepower from Quaker State. Unleash all your horses. And Michelin, a better way forward. Welcome to Motoring 88. Thanks, Brad. Now, I know yes, it seems there. like yesterday, but in fact, it was 21 years ago. Graham's first test drive as motoring made its debut on TSN. We've watched the young Fletcher boy navigate through the pylons and vehicles that handle like, well, check out this brake test. Enough to make you seasick. But you know what? We all thought the cars were pretty cool at the time, but today they seem, well, they seem old. Well, fast forward to 2009, and it's hard to believe that some of these vehicles might be one day considered outdated. So who was the best in class for 2009? Well, this week we are at Pie in the Sky Studios in Toronto as we present our annual one-hour Car of the Year special. We'll pick our segment winners, and then Annie and Alessandra will pull the wraps off our overall top vehicle for 2009. We've also posted our nominees on MotoringTV.com. You, our viewers, have voted, and we will compare your picks to ours. With me, as usual, our man behind the wheel each week on Test Drive, the young Graham Fletcher. And you know, Graham, I think what impresses me the most after all these years on motoring is the fact that you and I, Bill and Jim, are still alive and kicking. Alive. Well, alive, exactly. My first question to start things off for you is, thinking back to those early days, what impresses you the most about today's modern vehicle? In a word, quality. If you go back 15 or 20 years when we started, the Spectrum ran from truly horrible, something like the Lada, all the way through to not too bad. Now you fast forward to today. What you've got, the Spectrum starts at good and runs through exceptionally good and beyond. The other thing, there's more horsepower, better fuel economy and lower emissions. You don't get any better than that. Couldn't agree with you more. Let's get things started now with cars that will definitely put a smile on your face. Let's check out our nominees for top sports car of 2009. As with the original, the second generation Acura TSX is based on the latest European Honda Accord. Where North America demands large sedans with dozens of cup holders, the Europeans, well, they've learned to embrace the thrill of the drive. The TSX is the epitome of the European philosophy. With 201 horsepower under the hood, it's a willing worker that is capable of strafing a twisty road in a manner that betters many of its immediate peers. The Dodge Challenger is one of the most refreshing cars launched in recent memory and simply because it accomplishes two simple but important things. First, it has a timeless style that transcends the usual age boundary. Young and old gravitate towards it whenever it's stationary. Second, it has the grace and pace to back up its audacious looks, especially in SRT8 guys. With an oversized Hemi under its hood, the Challenger is both fast and fleet of foot which are not the dynamic traits one expects of a large car. For those that can't quite pony up the coin for the Mitsubishi Evo, there's always the rally art. Rather than being a mildly warmed over Lancer, this thing is a full-on road rocket. To begin with, it uses a 2.0-litre turbocharged 4 that churns out 237 horsepower and 253 pound-feet of torque. This fury is then relayed to the road through a twin-clutch transmission and Mitsubishi's excellent all-wheel drive system. As a package, it delivers an enviable bang for the buck quotient. Well, as you can see for motoring viewers, it was hands down the Dodge Challenger there. Yep, right on the money. It was one of the very few prized rides of the year. It really did impress me. It took a week to wipe the smile off my face. The thing that really impressed me though, and I mentioned it before, but it's worth mentioning again, it's one of the very few cars that actually transcends the age barrier. It didn't matter whether the onlooker was old or young, they loved the car. Big head turner. All yep. right, we've just got started. We'll be back with more as we continue to bring you our one hour Car of the Year special on TSN. We're back as motoring continues its one hour car of the year special. It won't be long before Annie and Alessandra will unveil our overall top vehicle for 2009. Let's now join Graham for our next category. The small automobile has come a very long way in a very short period of time and the trio in our best new small car category, well they really do speak to how good things have become. 
The first time around, the Honda Fit was just too boxy for its own good. This time around, Honda dumped the box and kept the toy. The newfound style also packages the needed goods. There's plenty of power, great fuel economy, nimble handling, and the sort of flexibility that's just not found at this end of the automotive price ladder. Everything that goes for the second generation Pontiac Vibe applies equally to the Toyota Matrix. This duo has grown up and now comes with the power the first version lacked. Yes, the base 1.8 litre engine is still a little pedestrian. The up level 2.4 litre engine and its 158 horsepower is anything but. This not only makes for a much more rewarding drive, it's good enough to power the Vibe and Matrix from rest to 100k in under 9 seconds. If small is where you're at, the Smart 4.2 is right up your alley. It's barely longer than the average car is wide, and yet it will accommodate two adult riders in complete comfort. It also delivers decent about-town performance. While the diminutive 1.0-litre engine only pushes 70 horsepower and 68 pound-feet of torque, it delivers wonderful fuel economy, a city average of 5.9 litres per 100k. Again, I agreed with the viewers and picked the Fit as our best new small car. The thing I really liked about it is the versatility. The other thing, the boxy look of old has gone in favor of much more road presence. It really is a very nice package now. And when it comes to fuel economy, great fuel economy, yep. which makes me and you question why we'd need a hybrid in this segment. The efficient gasoline engine does it all. All right, now a Car of the Year program wouldn't be complete without our Jim Kenzie and his views on how the automotive universe is unfolding. So here's Jimmy. Now one of the good news stories of 2008 was that traffic deaths are down. Now we shouldn't be that surprised because traffic deaths have been dropping steadily for decades. As a matter of fact, since 1979, Canadian road fatalities are down by almost 50 percent. That's a remarkable statistic. And it's due almost entirely to increased seatbelt use and stronger cars. Now the drop in 2008 was even stronger than we might have predicted. Now, the police departments across the country are claiming all sorts of credit that their street racing laws and their speed limit blitzes, and of course charging Brad Diamond with flashing his high beams at a radar trap, are responsible for this reduction. Well, a professor at Harvard Medical School has studied this phenomenon across North America, and he says the police activity completely irrelevant. What is different between 2008 and 2007? The price of gasoline, hello? and he has shown that this has been the case across the entire continent. If it's more expensive to drive, and it's expensive to drive quickly, you don't drive as much, you don't drive as fast. And in Canada, large parts of this country had the worst summer for weather ever. No point in driving to the cottage if it's gonna rain all weekend. So if the weather in 2009 is better, and if gasoline becomes free again, will the deaths go up? Well, it's up to you and me to make sure that number keeps going down. Michelin, a better way forward. This week's edition of the Better Way Forward comes from the 2009 Detroit Auto Show. This is where the folks from Michelin rub shoulders with their biggest customer, the world's automakers. And the talk is about cars and tires. Automakers also pick by price as they have to, but you know, when they know they need the tire, they will go to the ones they know will deliver. I mean, you take the example of when there was a recall on the Explorer, they came back and put Michelin's on it. When uh, you look at the CTS that they launched, it has PS2s. You look at the Corvette ZR1, the fastest Corvette ever built, it's on Michelin's, the first time ever not on a competitor. So, you know, again, tires do make a difference, and those who know tend to pick very selectively. If you're going to step back and think about it, the car is all about what touches the ground. And what touches the ground is the size of this, four pounds, that's it. All the horsepower, 600, 700, 200, 300 picket, gets transferred through those four touch points, which are the tires. So, if you want to stop quicker, whatever happens there is key. And now, more and more fuel efficiency is also part of what happens in those four pounds. In spite of the economic climate, the SUV is still an important part of the automotive landscape. Up next, our best new SUV category. Offered in both V6 and V8 versions, Kia's full-size Borrego is a rig to be reckoned with. In spite of its rather antiquated body-on-frame chassis, it still manages to deliver on both sides of the SUV spectrum. 
On one hand, the ride is comfortable and far from truck-like. On the other, it can tow up to 3,402 kilograms when properly equipped. The interior is just as good. Along with a healthy dose of standard equipment and some decent materials comes the needed flexibility and a third row seat. The Suzuki Grand Vitara is an often overlooked SUV. Yes, it lacks the glamour of some of its key competitors, but it works and very well. It has plenty of power, a good all-wheel drive system, and the desired flexibility and versatility. The fact it's now packaged in a handsome box and comes with the right creature comforts will make it much more of a force in the marketplace than it has been in the past. If it's a big lumbering rig that's needed, the Toyota Sequoia is the right truck. Its 5.7-litre engine puts 381 horsepower and 401 pound-feet of torque at the driver's disposal. This is enough power to put 100k on the clock in a speedy 7.1 seconds and to provide a brawny 3,990 kilogram towing capability. Naturally, it comes with a good one-touch all-wheel drive system, all of life's niceties and a full slate of safety equipment. Picking our best new SUV was a particularly tough task because I enjoyed all three vehicles and I liked a particular aspect of each one of them. However, the winner, the Suzuki Grand Vitara, and it boils down to its overall value. It really is a value-packed package. And the big thing about the new Vitara, they started with the six and now they've got the additional four-cylinder. All right, we'll be back with more as we continue with our one-hour Motoring Car of the Year special right after this. We're back as Motoring's One Hour Car of the Year special continues. Annie and Alessandra will be unveiling our top overall vehicle for 2009. But now let's join Graham for our next category. The family sedan under $30,000 category used to be run and owned by the domestics. This year, there's not one to be seen. While the stylistic differences between the old and new Sonata are not striking, the improvements to the rest of the vehicle make it a much better car. There's more power in both the four and six cylinder models, along with better fuel economy and a list of creature comforts that abounds. Perhaps the biggest step forward, however, is that the drab plastic interiors have given way for some much richer materials and a classier overall feel. One vehicle that has enjoyed almost universal praise and primarily for its bang for the buck quotient is the Kia Magentis. Yes, the outgoing car was a snoozer in the looks department and the interior was middling at best. However, the driving experience was well above the car's price position. The latest Magentis brings a stronger style, more road presence and better power. Likewise, the interior is now a match for its key competition. The beauty of the new Mazda 6 is twofold. First, it delivers the size the previous version lacked. More importantly, it ups the ante in terms of the power and handling. The base four-cylinder is good enough to keep the drive entertaining. Moving up to the V6 delivers a legitimate sports car. At last, a family sedan that fills the family obligation without sacrificing the joy of driving. Motoring's best new family sedan under $30,000 in a landslide victory, the Mazda 6. It really does solve an age-old dilemma. You want four doors for the family commitment, but you don't want to give up the joy of driving a truly sporty car. Now let's take a look at the family sedan, over $30,000. Nissan builds the latest Maxima as the four-door sports car. Certainly it has the looks, the right sort of handling, and with 290 stampeding ponies under the hood, it has the right sort of snap. However, all this good stuff is somewhat spoiled by the use of a continuously variable transmission. This thing just does not deliver the right driving feel or feedback. The rear drive G8 is offered in enough ways that it will appeal to just about all. The base 256 horsepower V6 is a good all-round family car that delivers the niceties of life and it's finished with a surprising level of quality. The GT 6.0-litre V8 injects much more life to the drive. However, if it's an all-out sports sedan you crave, slip behind the wheel of the G8 GXP. The 402 horsepower the 6.2-litre V8 slams to the road is simply sublime. The Volkswagen Passat CC swells the growing ranks of the coupe-inspired four-door, four-seat genre. Mechanically, the CC shares just about everything with the Passat sedan. 
However, it's the style and the quality of the interior that sets this version apart. The fact it handles very well, has plenty of power, and it's offered with VW's stellar 4-motion all-wheel drive system makes it a compelling ride. Well, Graham, we call it the family car segment, but I'll tell you, all three of those cars, there's a ton of performance in there. Absolutely. We could have called it the best new sports sedan. The winner, however, the Pontiac G8. I love that car, especially the GXP. When you stand on that gas pedal, hold on to your hat. The other thing that really surprised me, one question left in my mind. What took GM so long? <laughs> I'm with you. And you know, Pontiac has taken his hits over the years, but looking to the future, this G8 definitely should be a cornerstone. All right, later, Bill Gardner is going to come by and pick his top pickup truck. But at this time of the year, we like to let our number one mechanic in the Quaker State garage rant about the way we treat our vehicles. Bill? Brad, you know, I've been doing the uh, Quaker State National Car Care Month media tour for many years now, and I've noticed that over the years, customers have really got the message and they've really improved their habits in terms of how they maintain their vehicles, how they do scheduled maintenance. They've realized that doing scheduled maintenance adds to the resale value, adds to the trade-in value, enhances the safety of their vehicle. There's a whole host of good things that happen when you take care of your machinery. But here's one problem. I've noticed a couple of my customers lately phoning in Here's a situation where they've maybe moved further away from my shop, taken the car somewhere else for minor maintenance. One case in point, lady takes her car in for an oil change and a small noise in the front end of the car, gets the phone call a few hours later saying that the inner tie rod ends are completely worn out on her car. Now her car was very high mileage, over 300,000 K. So it wasn't an unbelievable kind of a thing that they could call and say that these parts were worn out, completely believable. However, not every car wears out its front end components at any specific mileage. Depends on the type of usage and the type of maintenance that you've, that you've done on the vehicle. I probably got the ultimate compliment from her husband when he phoned me and said, listen, they've quoted me $1,000 to replace the inner tie rod ends, parts, labor, and a wheel alignment. I'd rather give you the $1,000 than them. Can you do the job tomorrow? I dumped a job, took this job in, started it, started on the left side of the car, nothing wrong with it. Put it back together, went to the right side, started looking at it too and disassembling, trying to find the problem with this car. Even partially disassembled, separated the outer tie rod end to make sure there wasn't some range in the motion of that part where there was some play existing that maybe I'd overlooked. Nothing wrong with it. Put it all back together, drove it to the dealership, got the service manager, the shop foreman and the mechanic involved who had inspected this car and myself in the shop with the car in the hoist. I said, boys, show me the problem with this car. And they couldn't, they were pretty embarrassed. And the customer was really, really ticked off that they tried to take advantage of them for $1,000. Very soon after that, I had another car, virtually the same circumstance, only the story this time was unsafe lower ball joints. Again, a high mileage car, again, quite a believable story, especially given Southern Ontario or Canadian driving conditions, these parts will wear out. Guys, if you're trying to upsell a customer on something, please make sure that it's legit, that it's really required, that you haven't overquoted or you haven't got overzealous in trying to upsell a customer on a job, especially if you're doing it in the name of safety. And in both cases, these customers were told that the car was unsafe. They're responsible people. They don't want to drive an unsafe car. They wanted it fixed. They just wanted to spend their $1,000 with someone they trusted turned out it was completely unjustified. There is no room for that. It's not acceptable. Don't do it. You're eroding what little confidence motorists had in our profession. Stop it. End of story. Stay with us. We'll be back as we continue with Motoring's one hour Car of the Year special. Closed captioning on Motoring 2009 is brought to you by the 2009 Chevrolet Traverse Crossover. It's everything you've ever wished for, and then some. Underneath that cover is Motoring's pick for the best vehicle in the model year 2009. And it won't be long before Annie and Alessandra will pull the wraps off it. Let's now join Graham for a category we've never had before. Our best new green technology speaks to the fact that the environment is becoming of a greater concern to everybody. The three technologies in this category, they are the future. 
The two-mode hybrid system makes so much sense. It allows the vehicle to be driven on electric power at low speeds. In the mid-range, the electric side works with the engine to deliver the desired turn of speed. Once up to cruising speed, the electric side again plays a role as it helps to keep the V8 engine running in its four-cylinder mode for longer than it might otherwise. For those seeking a large vehicle with decent fuel economy, the two-mode hybrid is the answer and it does so without giving anything up in terms of towing ability. Mercedes-Benz Bluetech 2 system relies upon a number of basic steps to deliver clean power. The first is the 3.0-litre V6 engine, as its combustion process is designed to keep the emissions to a minimum in the first place. The last step calls for a harmless aqueous urea solution called AdBlue to be injected into the exhaust system. The allure of this powertrain is not difficult to grasp. It is between 20 and 40% more efficient than an equivalent gasoline-powered engine, and it puts 400 pound-feet of torque at the driver's right boot. In real estate, it's all about location. In the diesel world, it's all about torque production and reduced emissions. Volkswagen's latest 2.0-litre TDI diesel is a delightful motor that gives up absolutely nothing to be clean. It twists out a stellar 235 pound-feet of torque at 1,750 RPM and reduces the emissions by 90% when compared to the previous TDI engine. The fact it sips just 4.8 litres of diesel for every 100 kilometres it cruises the highway highlights the diesel advantage. After much deliberation, Motoring's Green Power Award goes to the two-mode hybrid system shared by Chrysler, Mercedes-Benz, BMW and General Motors. As a near-term solution, it works. Having taken a look at the best new green technology, it's now time to get onto the fun side of the road and take a look at our best new performance car under $50,000. The reason the old BMW 2002 has a soft spot in any driving enthusiast's heart is simple. It's fun to drive quotient. The fact it does not cost a fortune certainly helped. BMW's 1 Series Coupe picks up on these likeable traits and fast forwards them into the modern era especially in the 135i's case. Bolting two turbos onto a 3-litre engine delivers 300 horsepower and 300 pound-feet of torque. The upshot is a 0 to 100 km an hour time of 5.3 seconds. The go-kart-like feel and feedback for which BMW is famed then cements the deal. After being denied the Evo for so long, the anticipation and longing for the 10th generation car was, well, intense. The wait has been well worth the while. Its good looks and obvious breeding are only eclipsed by the manner in which it drives. The 291 horsepower 2 litre turbocharged engine is a blinder, the all wheel drive system is beyond reproach and the manner in which the electronic overseers work in complete harmony while well, it allows the tyres to be driven off the Evo with impunity. Years of punishment on the FIA World Rally Championship circuit have paid off handsomely for the Hyper Impreza WRX STI. Not only is this car 305 horsepower fast, it's packed with leading edge technology that for once is there for a specific reason. Everything from the all-wheel drive system to the manner in which the engine and electronic traction and stability control systems interact can be customized. The culmination is a purebred race car that just happens to be street legal. Brad says it's like kissing your sister, but we do have a tie in our performance car under $50,000. It didn't matter how I sliced and diced the numbers, the Mitsubishi Evolution and the WRX STI tied each other time and again. Yes, the Subaru's a little faster, the Evo's a little sharper on the racetrack, the two of them are superb cars and both are worthy winners. Now let's take a look at performance car over $50,000. Ask a gearhead what his or her favourite car is and the BMW M3 nameplate surfaces frequently. The latest version takes the mark to places it has not gone before. First there is a 414 horsepower V8 engine. Then there's the incredible suspension system and an active steering setup that sets new standards. The resulting ride is a four-door rocket that does not have to shy away from very many drag races. When the Chevrolet C6 Corvette debuted, it impressed. 
When the Z06 arrived, it underscored the VET's reputation for unadulterated power. The ZR1 actually makes the Z06 look almost tame. Not only does it boast 638 horsepower and 604 pound-feet of torque, it brings a mind-numbing run to 100k of just 3.4 seconds. The fact it handles as well as any car costing two or three times as much promises to make this VET a treasured collectible. Its tenure as one of the rides of choice in the Gran Turismo video game made it a legend. Through five generations, the GTR has been Nissan's flagship for outright performance and advanced technology. This version is no exception. To begin with, the turbocharged 3.8 litre V6 blows 480 horsepower through a twin clutch transmission and a proactive all wheel drive system. Throw in an adaptive suspension and an enormous set of Brembo brakes, and you have a car that eats racetracks for lunch. Well, for motoring viewers, it was a no brainer the Nissan GTR Graham. Well, I disagree. Uh, I think too many of them judge the value of the vehicle on its performance in the Gran Turismo video game. The real world car, it eats racetracks alive, but when it comes to living with it day to day, I couldn't stand it. So I went with the Corvette ZR1. Now you want to talk about a manly man's car, when those 600 plus stallions come online, you better hang on to your hat. And you know what they've always said about the Corvette for years is if General Motors can produce such a great vehicle, why can't some of that Corvette DNA trickle down into the rest of its product? Well, it is. And later on, one of our nominees is a very hot caddy. All right, here's Jim. Well, Brad, you're right. Those two cars are examples of how good the domestic industry has become, at least on the product side. And one part of those cars that I don't think gets enough credit is the tires. Now, it's not just because Michelin is a sponsor of this show, but those sport pilots, they are spectacular. The Canadian Ron Fellows, who was undoubtedly the best Corvette racer ever, says those tires are good for about four seconds a lap alone at a place like Watkins Glen. That's a huge difference. Now tires are a very complicated product because if you optimize for dry weather handling, you probably decrease tread wear and probably decrease wet performance as well. If you reduce rolling resistance for better fuel economy, you probably make the ride worse. So the key is to try and improve all of these attributes at the same time, keeping them affordable. And the improvement in performance in cars over the last 10 years has been largely responsible to improvements in tires and specifically winter tires, which in Canada, of course, is critically important. So tire companies of the world, keep it up. Don't go away. The Motoring Boys will be right back as our Car of the Year special continues. Rolling. Keep it simple, stupid. But now they're heading. Oh, it was going right up my nose, Dan. <laughs> it wasn't for the bug. I was laughing. Now. More information in the Glade. The Glade's Clusler. The Glade's Clusler. I hate wet weather. Make the Wayne go away, mummy. Okay, we're doing this for the team. Here, let's go. It limits the box length to five foot box length. Box length. Limits the box length. Box length. Box length. <laughs> yeah, baby. All right, let's head to the Quaker State Garage and join Bill Gardner. That's the one right there. That's the one. That's the one right there. And the sun came out. Holy sh. The day, the day, the day. Right, okay, <clears throat> this is the one. Not only are they comfortable, they can, it needs a tilt adjustment too, sorry. The minor complaints, the tear up, that's where you'll find an, un, an uh, uh, first, the steering, it only t tilts. Tilts. Sorry, man. Don't worry, I brought lunch. Welcome back. What is our top vehicle for 2009? We'll find out soon, but first let's join Graham for our next category. When you talk luxury car, you talk a very changing marketplace. Two years ago, you wouldn't even have dreamt that this car would be on the road. It's now actually in as one of our best new luxury cars. What a turnaround. The Hyundai Genesis is a mid-sized rear-drive luxury car that's offered with a lusty 290 horsepower V6 and the company's first V8 engine. 
The latter is not only silky smooth, it packs a serious 375 horsepower punch. Factor in an impeccable ride quality and interior that's loaded to the nines, and you have a vehicle that streets ahead of anything Hyundai has ever offered before. The outgoing Acura TL Type S was a blinder. The latest TL runs rings around it, which is no easy feat. The base car now comes with more power than the S, while the up-level SH all-wheel drive and its advanced all-wheel drive system is the most powerful Acura produced to date. Throw in a delightful interior handling to beat the band, and you have a serious set of wheels. If there is a downside, it is that the new face is a love-it-or-hated affair. In the past, Audi played second fiddle to other German marks, BMW and Mercedes-Benz in particular. That was then, today it's a very different story. To begin with, the A4 now has the interior space to match its delightful driving dynamics. The ability the A4's Quattro system brings to the party has to be experienced to be fully appreciated. All in all, the new car is a combination that's very easy to like and very difficult to overlook. Picking the best new luxury car was a very difficult task because I particularly like the Acura TL SH all-wheel drive. However, in the end, it was the Hyundai Genesis. Now, who would have thought that Hyundai could produce a car like that? Now, I'm a betting man. I would have lost my money because it takes Hyundai to a place they've never been before. Nobody's talking about the pony anymore, and this company continues to surprise. In fact, they've got the lineup completely covered with the exception of a pickup truck, and they're even impressing some of the more cynical automotive journalists, like our colleague from the National Post, David Booth. He said, who would have thunk it would be Hyundai that would finally catch up to BMW? How about that? All right, now let's check out our nominees for the prestige category. Take a very capable car and stuff a monster 6.2 litre supercharged motor under the hood and you have the new Cadillac CTS-V. This stately ride rockets to 100k in just 4.9 seconds and it bridges the 80 to 120 gap in a blistering 3.9 seconds. You can thank the 556 horsepower and 551 pound-feet of torque on tap for that. It's a sublime ride that never leaves the driver wanting. Well, other than for more time behind the wheel, that is. When Lexus introduced the IS in 2001, the company made it known it wanted to play in the truly sporty leagues. Welcome to the boldly styled ISF. Not only is it fast, it handles like the Dickens and now comes with an exhaust note that sounds simply marvellous. Noise, however, a sports car does not make unless it has the right sort of power. So Lexus took its 4.8 litre V8 engine and reworked it to the tune of 416 horsepower. The net effect is a 0 to 100k time of 4.8 seconds, which ranks up there with the very best. A good friend of mine termed the new Mercedes-Benz CL550 the Gentleman's Express, and for good reason. The interior is as opulent and as comfortable as any car gets, just what any self-respecting gentleman demands. Lift the hood and you'll find the Express part. The 5.5-litre V8 engine produces 382 horsepower, and more importantly, 391 pound-feet of torque at just 2,800 RPM. This is enough to walk 2,095 kilograms of leather line luxury to 100K in 5.9 seconds. Graham Fletcher, those are three hot vehicles. They most certainly are, and I particularly like the Cadillac CTS-V. That thing has got more kick when you hammer the gas pedal. Anyway, I picked the Lexus ISF overall, primarily because it was the most rounded package of the lot. It's extremely quick, but it's also very docile when driven in town. And I know one guy, even if he won the lottery, who wouldn't spend a dime on luxury or prestige, and that's our man in the Quaker State Garage, Bill Gardner. As we all know, Bill is a truck guy. And that's why Bill has our nominees for top pickup of 2009. The Ford F-150 looks a lot like last year's model, but it's significantly different and improved. The all new fully boxed hydroformed frame with high strength steel side rails is 10% improved in torsional rigidity while shedding 100 pounds. Powertrain, 12% fuel economy improvement on the 5.4 liter three valve per cylinder V8. A new three valve per cylinder version of the 4.6 liter V8 now available. Fuel economy gains so significant on the 4.6 liter two valve per cylinder V8 that it equaled last year's V6 and bumped it out of the lineup. And an all new, super robust six speed automatic transmission. 
Just like the Ford, the Dodge Ram pickup is significantly improved in all areas. The 5.7 liter Hemi V8 has always had great power and torque, but earlier versions had poor fuel economy. Cylinder deactivation a couple of years ago, and now variable valve timing and other engine enhancements have improved engine efficiency. Horsepower is up again to 380, and fuel economy is improved too, so that Dodge can hold its own against Ford and GM in the fuel mileage war. The biggest news in the chassis department is a new coil spring rear suspension replacing the tried and true rear leaf springs that previous Ram pickups and all other pickups use. On the utility front, the optional lockable toolboxes are a great step forward in pickup truck utility. You know, it was a tough call for truck of the year between the Ford and the Dodge. I really like both of them. And the neat thing about this year is that both Ford and Dodge have significantly closed that gap. They were lagging behind GM pickups in fuel economy. The improvements that they've both made have closed that gap significantly while improving a host of other items. But you know what? I was looking for the tiebreaker when it came down to these two, and it just fell right into my lap. And there's a pun intended there as well. One of the things that I was doing with the pickup truck was carrying cargo, which I normally do in my job, and about the second or third day that I had the Dodge, I was unloading some cargo, actually standing in the box, just like I am now. Got to the edge of the cargo box, went to get out, and when I stepped on this plastic piece, it broke right off the tailgate and I fell pretty hard. When I started looking at it, it's the flimsiest, thinnest, cheapest, most Mickey Mouse thing you've ever seen in your life. It's totally inevitable that it's gonna break off and you're gonna fall. They're gonna replace a whole bunch of these under warranty and they're gonna have some really cheesed off customers. So that was the tiebreaker and why the Ford F-150 is the motoring 2009 pickup truck of the year. My wish list for 2009, well, I'm talking straight to Transport Canada because there are four things you guys have to make mandatory in cars. Forget about airbags in the rear seat, they're completely irrelevant. Four things in increasing order. Number one, daytime running lights have to eliminate the back of the car. So many people are driving along at night or in rain and fog, their instrument lights are on, they can see a bit of light in front because of the DRLs, but on the highway, it's the back lights that have to come on. Now some car makers do this right and turn all your headlights on all the time. You as an individual driver should do that as well. But Transport Canada, come on, this is a slam dunk. Number two, equally obvious, amber turn signals on the back. Most European cars have them in Europe and they bolt red taillight lenses on for North America. That's insane. They do it for styling reasons. Come on, safety is more important than styling. Slam dunk, easy to do. Number three, directional stability control. Now this is becoming mandatory in a couple of years. Why wait? I mean, with anti-lock brakes, we don't have statistical proof that they save lives. But DSC, the numbers are clear. Get it done and get it done now. The most important thing, active headrests. Whiplash is the injury that keeps on giving. It's the most expensive injury in car crashes. It's debilitating, lost time, medical costs. It completely outweighs everything else. Death. That's cheap, you bury the guy. Active headrests are standard in some cars costing as little as $19,000. There's no excuse for every car not to have active headrests because they reduce whiplash by up to 75%. If the car companies won't do it, Transport Canada, it's your job to make them do it. We're getting very close to the unveiling of Motoring's overall best vehicle for 2009. And when we come back, the nominees for one of the most popular segments in today's automotive world. Stay with us. Welcome back to Motoring's Car of the Year special. Now here's Graham with our nominees for best new CUV under 35,000. When Chrysler decided to get into the crossover market, its first attempt, the Pacifica, was not received very well. It was just too expensive and underpowered. The journey is the polar opposite. To begin with, there's the required flexibility, seating for up to seven, better power and significantly more substance to its makeup. It's also pretty evident that a lot of thought went into getting this vehicle right the first time around. Subaru is famous for making evolutionary and not revolutionary changes to its vehicles. The sleek new style and interior quality upgrades aside, this holds true for the third generation Forester. In just about every area there are subtle changes for the better. 
Everything from a revised engine to a considerably larger body that's much stronger. Factor in the increased size, utility and an excellent all-wheel drive system and you have a significantly more refined ride. Volkswagen is late joining the compact crossover segment, however its timing is anything but tardy. With the economy souring, the full-size Brute is on the wane, while the compact and mid-size segments are booming. The Tiguan is a tight package that's a cut above the norm. It has a rich feel, great driving dynamics and a potent engine that delivers V6-like power with four-cylinder-like fuel economy. It's a package that's difficult to overlook. A tough category, but in the end, the Subaru Forester reigns supreme and claim motoring's best new crossover under 35k. We're going to continue the crossover theme as we take a look at our three candidates for the best new crossover over $35,000. Some call it funky, others are less polite. Either way, the Ford Flex has a style it can call its own. It also does the crossover thing as well as anything in the segment. There's a ton of room, comfortable seating in all three rows, and all the creature comforts one could want, including Ford's award-winning hands-free sync system. It also rides and drives more like a large wagon than an SUV, yet it can haul a useful 2,041 kilogram trailer. The latest pilot arrives with more road presence and a considerably larger interior. The ability to accommodate eight riders and a couple of sets of golf clubs certainly impresses. It also comes with an engine that makes it much less of a gas guzzler than the usual SUV. The ability to make the V6 engine run on three or four of its six cylinders when the conditions are right brings better fuel efficiency without sacrificing power when it's really needed. Along with a refreshed, if familiar, look, the Nissan Murano benefits from standard all-wheel drive and a more powerful version of Nissan's highly respected 3.5-litre V6 engine. As with the Maxima, it's the continuously variable transmission that lets the side down. Hammer the gas and the Murano tends to get rather noisy. It also means there is a distinct lack of engine braking, which gives the regular brakes an unwanted workout on a downhill run. The winner of our best new crossover, over $35,000, the Ford Flex. This thing does the crossover thing as well as anything on the market. It's got three very comfortable rows of seats and it handles and drives very nicely. What I'm looking forward to in particular, when Ford brings out the three and a half liter EcoBoost engine. Now this thing promises to deliver V8-like performance, but be easy on gas. The biggest story of 2008, unfortunately, it was a sad one, and that was the challenges faced by the domestic car industry. Now, as we mentioned earlier, they are building better cars. The problem is they're getting penalized for being old. We've talked about this on the show before, but the cost of maintaining their older workforce and their retirees puts them at a huge disadvantage, the companies who have only been in this country for 15 or 20 years. Now this problem basically has been caused by the government failing to look after the pension and medical needs of its own citizens. They put that responsibility on the companies, which is stupid. So the government created this problem, so I've got no problem with the government helping the car companies with bridge loans to help them recover. I sure hope it works because it's pretty hard to imagine the industry without General Motors, Ford or Chrysler. Don't go away. The moment you've all been waiting for is coming up as our Car of the Year special continues. We're back and this is the moment we've all been waiting for as we unveil our overall best vehicle for 2009. First, let's see who our viewers have selected and it is the Nissan GTR. Good choice, but do we agree? Well, before I hand it off to Graham with our winner, here's Jim. Well, you know, the script for this part of the car of year show almost never changes because Brad and Graham get it wrong just about every year. And when I look at the roster of candidates this year, I'm afraid they're probably going to make it wrong again. Because there really only are two cars on there that really qualify. Because a car of the year is supposed to be something special, something that really moves the goalposts. And those two candidates for me are the Mazda 6, that's kind of my miscongeniality, because it's got room, it's got comfort, it's got ride quality, it's got low noise levels. It's tough to make a big splash in that market segment because it's very well developed and there are already some great cars in there. But the Mazda 6 really stands out, great value as well. But the clear winner 
obvious as the nose on Graham's face, is a car that has great performance, great handling, great build quality, equal to some of the best cars that Germany can produce. But it comes from a company that's not known for building cars like this, and from a country that's not known for building cars like this. Yep, it's obvious slam dunk. The car of the year for 2009 is the Hyundai Genesis. Okay, Graham, take it away and prove that you're wrong again. If gas was cheaper and I was making a little more money than Jim, yes, maybe the Hyundai Genesis would have made a very worthy car of the year. I went the opposite direction. I picked affordability, fuel economy, and flexibility. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Motoring's 2009 car of the year, the Honda Fit. The reason, very simple. It is small, it's affordable, it's great on gas, and yet it's got all the versatility you could possibly want without having to carry a whole load of unwanted automobile around everywhere you go. Well, we want to congratulate Honda and the Fit and, of course, all our winners. And, you know, it's been a tough year for car companies, but, hey, suck it up. Join the crowd. But you know what? We are lucky enough here on Motoring to be able to drive all the brand-new vehicles each year as well as meeting the men and women who build them. The bottom line is they're no different than you and I. They want to build safe, reliable, and environmentally friendly cars and, of course, throw a little emotion in on the side. And I think the future is a bright one. Before we go, we want to thank you, our viewers, for watching every week and, of course, participating in our Car of the Year poll. And, of course, we want to thank our sponsors. Without them, we wouldn't be on the air 21 years later. Now, if you've missed part of this program or any program since 1988, check them out on MotoringTV.com. That's it for now. We'll see you next time out as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. Motoring 2009 on TSN has been brought to you by the new Q Horsepower from Quaker State. Unleash all your horses and Michelin, a better way forward.